The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to today's WCET webcast. We are very excited about this topic, and we have a wonderful presenter for you. The Promise and Peril of Artificial Intelligence for Teaching and Learning. My name is Megan Raymond. I am the Assistant Director for Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. And as we go through today, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the question box. You can also communicate with us via the chat box. So if you have any resources to share, go ahead and add them there. We tend to have a pretty active Twitter discussion, and the hashtag to follow along for that is hashtag WCET webcast. And we'll be taking questions from there as well. So feel free to either enter the question into the question box or on Twitter. Again, this webcast will be recorded and made available to our participants either on our YouTube channel or you will receive a link to it shortly after the live webinar. Slides are a little behind, so I apologize. Hoping they'll catch up here so we're all on the same page. The PowerPoint slides can be downloaded and accessed via the handout page if you'd like to click on that and then you can follow along. I'm going to go ahead and get us moving here. So our first, our presenter today is Brian Finley and he's from the, he's the Director of Instructional Technology at the University of Arkansas at Monticello. And our moderator today is David Dannenberg, who's the Director of Academic Innovations and E-Learning at the University of Alaska in Anchorage. And before I pass it off to them, I'll take us through the flow for today's presentation. We'll talk about what is artificial intelligence? How is artificial intelligence being used in higher ed? How do we manage the growing presence of artificial intelligence? And then we'll do a brief summary and get to your questions. So again, if you have questions, enter them into the question box. We anticipate that we will have a pretty large audience today. So if we have more questions than we have time to get through, I'll pull those questions, provide those to the presenter, and he'll provide written responses, and we'll get those back out to you. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it off to our moderator today, David Dannenberg. Go ahead, David. Hi. Thank you, Megan, and welcome, everyone. Very excited to be here to be moderating this session. Uh, been a long time, very interested in looking at virtual worlds and augmented reality, and I think this is just the next step in that evolution of uh, artificial intelligence. So I, I'm pleased to be here to be facilitating. And again, I will just uh, call out that if you do have questions as you're going through, uh, please do put them into the questions box and I will get to them pretty much. I'll try to keep it up in the order they're received as we get to the end of the session where we do have about 10, 15 minutes allowed for question and answers. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to Brian and I let him start. Well, hello everybody. This is Brian Finley, <clears throat> and I'm I'm really excited to be here to talk to you today about artificial intelligence in higher education. <clears throat> now, you may hear me today um, saying AI a lot, and that's that's kind of the acronym for for artificial intelligence. And if you if you say artificial intelligence a lot, you start looking for an acronym. And um, <clears throat> before we start, I, I kind of wanted to talk about something, the word disruptive. I know in ed tech, we have used the word disruptive a lot of times to describe a lot of different things from mobile computing to the internet, to MOOCs, whatever it may be. <clears throat> and I think that artificial intelligence is also kind of a disruptive technology, if you'll allow me to use that, that term. And uh, I, I think as you see, as we go along, it, it may actually be one of the most disruptive of all technologies that we've seen so far. So we need to start off with um, kind of a, a definition of, of trying to determine what is artificial intelligence. And the national, um, our federal government, they, they did some research on artificial intelligence and they came up with a statement that says it's a, it's a transformative technology that holds tremendous potential. And I think that may be one of the most disarming statements that has ever been made because you know this ai stuff artificial intelligence is coming at us very quickly and um i think that as a whole 
as a society, I don't think we really quite understand it. And I'm sure in higher ed, we probably don't understand exactly the tsunami that's fixing to, fixing to hit us with this technology that we're going to need to be prepared for. This It's going to kind of change a lot of what we're doing. Gartner called uh, Gartner calls it uh, one of three megatrends that's going to shape digital business in the next 10 years. And um, the megatrend, you know, if if we think about ourselves in higher ed, we, we usually don't think of ourselves as a digital business. But I think we really are kind of a digital business because everything we do is we're starting to rely more and more on data, even in higher ed. And whether that's with learning analytics, with um, being able to move data around for credentials, whatever it may be. So I think that we're really kind of lumped into this group that's going to be affected by this mega trend of artificial intelligence. So with that in mind, you know, I think we have to we have to really kind of prepare ourselves. And if you've been on the internet read any blogs and any Google searches on artificial intelligence or if you've been on Twitter you're gonna see that there's a lot of information out there about artificial intelligence and I think one of the big challenges is just knowing where do you start uh, to learn about artificial intelligence how do you you know figure out what's just sensationalism what's real and um, you know how does it really affect you in your in your day-to-day -day job and I, that's what I'm kind of hoping for today is that we'll kind of be able to put a handle on this and start the conversation about artificial intelligence. Hey, Brian, I hate to interrupt. I just want to let folks know that we are trying to get the, the slides to advance. Um, Megan was having a little bit of an issue on her PC, so it's having to get it everything re- uh, reconnected. So I, I do apologize. Um, but the slides are available uh, in the handout section. Um, and we should be seeing that. Uh, you should see that on the right hand column. Okay, is it okay Sorry, for me to uh, go ahead, Dave? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we just got to the slide about uh, you know we had a lot of information coming to us and how do we how do we discern what's what's the best information? So you know we really kind of need to start with on the next slide uh, defining artificial intelligence. What do we really mean by by artificial intelligence? And um, you know the hard part about that is even even the experts are having a hard time agreeing what artificial intelligence is and what it is not. Basically, if you boil it down, there seems to be some agreement on the fact that um, artificial intelligence uh, is something that can solve complex problems and um, kind of feels like, uh, you know, there's a human being thinking through that process. And, you know, there's a lot of ways we, we go about that. One of the better ways to try to get a handle on artificial intelligence is to actually think about the history of artificial intelligence. And this is not going to be a long history lesson because artificial intelligence itself has not really been around all that, that long for there to be a lot of history. But if we were to look at the history of artificial intelligence, one of the first people that you're going to always usually see come up is Alan Turing. And Alan Turing was born in England in the early 1900s. He was a, a, a professor of mathematics, studied uh, cryptology, and um, he's, he's noted for something called the Turing test. And what's notable about the Turing test was around 1950s, uh, it, you know, he, he came up with the proposition is, uh, can, a, can a computer um, think, can a machine think? That, that was it, can a machine think? And of course he was an academic, so uh, you know, there was a lot of um, debate over that, over what, you know, what does a machine mean? What does think mean? And so he kind of changed his proposition to, can a computer uh, fool somebody into thinking that they're a, they're a human being? And that's basically kind of what the Turing test is. And if you think about it, uh, we're, we're dealing with some of that already in our day-to-day -day lives. If you've, if you've dealt with a chat bot anywhere, maybe through a hotel 
or on a website you see the little thing pop up where somebody asks you if you need some help or if they can help you you're probably dealing with a chat bot and you know it may feel as though you're working with it with a human being but there's actually a machine there that's conversing with you so Alan Turing wasn't that far off and when this happened was really not not really all that long ago if we look at the timeline for artificial intelligence. We see between 1950 and 1980, artificial intelligence was pretty much just um, somebody, you, you took a domain expert and they programmed in the answers that the machine would need to, to um, you know, say what was expected from it. And that's, that's kind of where artificial intelligence was at that point. But there was a big shift uh, around 1980, uh, 2010, and that's that's when machine learning came along. And machine learning, as we'll learn a little bit later, it has has a lot to do with artificial intelligence and where we are today. And then in 2010, the thing that's that's pushed us even further with artificial intelligence is something called deep learning. And deep learning is a little bit mysterious, and uh, that term gets thrown around a little bit. It's kind of like blockchain. It gets thrown around a lot, but a lot of people really aren't sure exactly what it what it is. So, you know, we really kind of need to think about defining artificial intelligence a little bit further. And one way we can do that is by looking at some different examples of artificial intelligence, because as you can see, the definitions are in a lot of places. Uh, the timeline, you know, we've we learned a little bit about the timeline of it. But what are some good examples? Some of the things that we're familiar with already for for AI breakthroughs are things like self-driving cars. I think pretty much everybody has heard of self-driving cars at this point. But interestingly, self-driving cars, I believe it was Mercedes that actually had a self-driving car. Uh, in the in the 50s it, back in there so I mean they've been around for a while it's just acceptability of it and you know a really good working model of it has not been around until recently another AI breakthrough and this goes with the machine learning is when we switch to statistics for what the artificial intelligence works with and you know that that goes back to in the early days they you know you had the domain expert who programmed in the examples whereas statistics allow the machine to be able to take data and make decisions on it itself. We also talk about natural language processing. Um, and and this, one, this one I find very interesting. Whenever we started, natural language processing has been around a long time. It just, we didn't have the processing power to do it quickly. But even though most of us are familiar with natural language processing. We use it on our phones. We use it at, at home maybe with Alexa or Google Home. It, it still has somewhat of that novelty effect for us. I don't know if you've noticed that, but it, it still kind of has that novelty. It feels like a toy, but there's really a lot going on with natural language processing, and it's really very key to making artificial intelligence um, work, with, work with us as human beings and feel like a, a natural part of our lives. And the last thing on this list is GPUs. Uh, th that stands for graphical processing units. And normally with a computer, if you want to perform mathematical calculation, a CPU has to do that within sequence. It processes one calculation, then the next. And you can overcome that with multiple CPUs. But what was discovered is that with a graphical processing unit, you could run um, you know mathematical operations in parallel and this was much faster and much more economical which is really a huge breakthrough for artificial intelligence because it needed that processing power and to be able to do it. and of course the economics really helped it scale in a much better way also if we think about categories of artificial intelligence um, you know they can really kind of be lumped in about three categories and or different types of styles for say uh, one systems that think like humans and that's where we use like cognitive architectures like neural networks and, and things that we see in data mining so you know neural networks and data mining was 
kind of the thought process was behind that was to kind of try to design something like the human mind or how a thought would take place. Um, also, we see sometimes um, our artificial intelligence systems, they seem to act like human beings. And that goes back to like the Turing test with natural language processing, um, you know, different types of reasoning, and even the ability maybe at this point in time for a machine to be able to learn from you things that, that you're interested in. Say, for example, I have a Nest thermostat at my house that is supposed to learn, uh, you know, what temperatures my family likes at certain times, uh, what our, our habits are going and coming from the house. So, you know, we're, we're seeing artificial intelligence in a lot of our consumer products. And also, just systems that think rationally. And I think that's where some of our biggest fears come from is as we move more into a, an AI-centric world, particularly in higher ed, uh, are those machines going to think rationally and make the right decisions, the same decisions a reasonable human being would make in a, in a similar situation? Now, as far as different roles that artificial intelligence can take on. Um, we, we see artificial intelligence where it works right along beside a human being. Um, so, you know, for example, maybe in a classroom situation, um, you know, functional AI working beside a human being could be things that could help a student. Maybe it'll help them remember things, help them retrieve information, and if you think about it, there was a time whenever things like spell checking was kind of frowned upon in education. Now spell checkers, we don't think anything of allowing somebody to use a spell checker, but there was a time when that, that was a little bit of a taboo. So we may see uh, situations come about in higher ed where students are using artificial intelligence to help them perform their, their job role within a course. Also, um, artificial intelligence can help you whenever you have some type of cognitive overload. And, um, you know, this can happen with things like um, with decision making, um, different things like that. Sometimes we see this like in, um, you know, air traffic controllers. But we could probably see this same type of thing in higher ed with some of our student success systems that are going online. You know, we're collecting all kinds of data there. We're always trying to create dashboards to help us determine when a student's in danger of, of failing a course or falling behind. So we have that. Also, we look at artificial intelligence possibly um, performing some type of function uh, for a human being. And as far as artificial intelligence is concerned in higher ed, probably where we're going to see um, these artificial intelligence take root the quickest is probably going to be in areas um, on the administrative side of things as opposed to, to the classroom side. Uh, because a lot of the jobs that, that artificial intelligence is really good at are repetitive jobs that deal with any type of mathematical operation or any kind of um, guidance. And, and that seems perfect for the service side of higher ed. So we may see artificial intelligence take root there before we see it really take root in uh, classroom teaching. So if artificial intelligence is moving quickly, you know, it's it's coming out as quickly. Some people even say we need a, um, a speedometer for artificial intelligence so we know what's going on. So if it is moving quickly, why is it moving so quickly? And some of, the, some of the things that have really pushed uh, artificial intelligence quickly is machine learning ha has evolved fast. And we saw some of that had to do with some of our increased processing powers, you know, all these types of things. But one big part of it is, is the digital economy. You know, there's just an, there's economic incentives for businesses to get involved with artificial intelligence. Uh, with so much of our economy being digital, we just have a lot more data that we can use now, and machine learning needs data to do its job. Uh, whereas before artificial intelligence, when it had to do with a domain expert, 
all that extra data didn't really help us that much. Now, since we're more machine uh, learning centric in artificial intelligence, all that data is really the fuel to drive it. And consumer demand. A lot of people are interested in what artificial intelligence can do for them. We don't think about a lot of the things that, that artificial intelligence gives us in our day-to-day -day life because it becomes, like any good technology, it becomes transparent to us. We don't even think about what's going on behind it, but we all want to benefit from the, the health benefits of artificial, in, you know, artificial intelligence and so forth. So we talked about machine learning. I've been talking about machine learning quite a bit because really when we're talking about artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is really, it's a pretty big umbrella term. And, you know, machine learning is really kind of the way that, that artificial intelligence is, is happening now and in this, this time. So the different types of machine learning that we have are, the machine is able to learn without being programmed. It can kind of just do its own own thing and it can learn from itself. And machine learning uses a lot of mathematical algorithms to do its job. A lot of them that you may be familiar with like linear regression, logistic regr uh, regression, uh, decision trees. And it, and it uses these algorithms to to learn and make different types of predictions. Uh, or to put things in categories. And uh, it can even learn from trial and error uh, and try to learn to make um, some of the best decisions that it can. So let's talk a little bit about deep learning. We started off with, with artificial intelligence and then I kind of switched you to machine learning. I told you we're gonna talk about artificial intelligence then I told you, well, artificial intelligence is really, it kind of has more to do with machine learning now. And where that's kind of going is in something called deep learning. Now, deep learning, it's a little, it's a little harder to understand. And e even sometimes the experts don't quite understand deep learning uh, because one of the things that's going on there is, you know, the machine itself is trying to take problems and, and solve it. it. It Basically, it takes a problem, solves it at one layer, branches off, and then solves it at other layers and continues working. And, you know, it's basically what it's doing is kind of creating those branching neurons that we have in a, a brain to connect ideas. Or if you want to think about a mind map, it's, it's kind of doing it in that kind of way. And... Um, you know, if, if anything's going to get us to that science fiction state of um, artificial intelligence, deep learning is. And one of the kind of the problems with deep learning at this point is sometimes it's providing us with, with answers or insights that even the experts aren't quite sure about the math that it used to get to some of those things. So we still have a lot of work to do in the area of deep learning, and that's kind of the bleeding the bleeding edge of artificial intelligence. Now, if you were to look at the patents in deep learning, you would see, you know, starting, you see here starting in 2014, there was a sharp rise in deep learning patents. So that kind of gives you a feel for the, the interest in this and the speed at which it's increasing over time. We also see uh, there is a huge uptick in on this next slide of how artificial intelligence, I mean, deep learning is the increase in mentions in professional journals. So obviously there's a lot going on with deep learning and a, and a lot's trying to take place there and that ties directly in to artificial intelligence. All right, so the next slide, this is what you came for. You know, what about artificial intelligence in, in higher education? What's going on with that? And, um, you know, now that we know how long it's been around, you know what artificial intelligence is, machine learning, all those kind of things. It's time to kind of see how this is going to affect what we do in our day-to-day our -day jobs. I want to start with a, um, a story about Elmo. And, 
you know, it may seem a little odd to tell a story about Elmo to a higher ed audience, but Sesame Street was, you know, it was a public access program to teach children, and it was one of the first to actually have learning objectives. And later on, they came up with this character named Elmo. Now, I talked about disruption a little bit earlier. You could say Elmo was a bit disruptive for Sesame Street because some critics said that there was too much focus on Elmo when he came along and a lot of the other characters had to kind of take a back seat. But Elmo was a star and he continued to get some good billing on Sesame Street. But today it's reported that Sesame Street is working with, with IBM to try to create a an Elmo that works more in an adaptive learning style to work with kids and to help teach children. And, uh, you know, I suppose that this may come out as a, at some point in time in the future, as a doll that works with children that has some, some artificial intelligence built into it to help teach children. And I think a lot of times what I hear from faculty uh, when I talk about artificial intelligence, they say, oh, you're going to have a robot replace me and, and teach my class. And I think we're a long, long way from that type of uh, generalized artificial intelligence and I think most experts would agree. But on this next slide, we talked about, you know, the possibility of an Elmo doll that can, can help teach a kid. Hanson Robotics has something called Professor Einstein. And Professor Einstein, uh, he, can answer questions about, you know, scientific type stuff, the things that, that kids have homework on. He's kind of designed for a little bit older older kid. Uh, he can also show a, you know, a slide presentation on a, on a subject like, you know, gravitational pull or something like that. He can talk about it and show things and you can ask him questions like you do Alexa. And, um, you know, so the possibility uh, you know, who knows? Maybe there will be a robot that teaches a class someday. Now, this next one is, this is Sophia the robot. And the reason why I want to bring her up is because if you ever want to make a serious artificial intelligence uh, researcher or scientist mad, start talking about Sophia the robot. Generally, they don't like her because they say that she's really not true artificial intelligence. But let me tell you a couple things about Sophia first. One, she spoke before the United Nations. Two, she's been on talk show ho she's been on talk shows. Um, you know, she's even presenting, uh, doing like keynote presentations at, at conferences now. Uh, so, you know, Sophia gets around. But I think the thing that these researchers are really kind of upset about with when they see, um, the public reacting to Sophia the robot is the fact that Sophia, she kind of has a tendency to really freak people out. Uh, they, they get creeped out by her and they get scared about the robot apocalypse and all that stuff. If you ever see any of the responses on Twitter to her or on YouTube, you're going to see a lot of these types of comments. And I think that may be what these um, researchers and I, AI are concerned about because um, they feel like that the public's response to this could hold back real progress in artificial intelligence uh, because people are going to be afraid. Uh, people are going to think that artificial intelligence is much further along than it really is. And, you know, that, that could be damaging. And that's something that we need to consider uh, on our own campuses as we start to bring artificial intelligence on and talk about it. And I promise you, when you start talking about artificial intelligence with most people, they're going to start making a lot of robot jokes and uh, think you're think you're a little nuts, um, even though artificial intelligence is already all the way around us. So, how how is machine learning actually kind of manifesting itself in higher ed light right now? If if I had given this talk a year ago, it'd be pretty easy for me to probably give a list of companies that have that we deal with in higher ed that that have artificial intelligence built into their products. But right now, it, it seems like everybody is is rushing to try to put some kind of artificial intelligence into the products that we're buying into in, in higher ed. Um, but I, I think that they fall into some categories. Um, you know, there's something called a copot, and that's basically a, a 
a robot or, you know, we don't want to get the, the term robot confused with artificial intelligence, although they tend to kind of go together. But uh, a bot can also be kind of a, you know, a, something that, that it doesn't have. Usually a robot does something physical. A bot kind of does something in the digital world. But a cobot works with you to do things. Um, you know, think about it. if you use Twitter, you know, you can you can like all the people who who retweet you or or you can automate the process with a bot of liking everything that somebody retweets. So, you know, in higher ed, you could have possibly, we have bots that help grade papers or help answer students' questions, um, you know, as a teaching assistant. So that's kind of a cobot situation. It takes some of the load off the, the faculty member for what they're doing. We also have, um, you know, cognitive agents that, that can help us think or in, in like we mentioned before, high, high times of overload. And, um, you know, those, those are going to be there to help us. And then another, another thing is the targeting. Uh, a lot of times with machine learning, machine learning is really good at targeting, pulling out outliers and finding categories and putting things in um, different buckets, so to speak. And that's that's really a lot of what's going on in our analytic tools for student success and for a large part even in learning management systems a lot of times we're kind of doing a lot of targeting by looking at the data seeing who's turned things in who's making good grades whatever and then putting them in the different categories they need to be in so how do we prepare our campus for artificial intelligence well one thing is we um, we have to be ready when artificial intelligence comes comes to campus, and there's a few things that we really need to consider when we're doing that. First thing I want to do, I want to tell you a uh, illustrate it by a quick story. This this is Abu's story, and Abu is a uh, he's a high school student, and they had a project to do, you know, and instead of like programming a calendar. Uh, he, and I didn't put a picture of Abu because I wasn't sure how to skirt the copyright issues for a picture of him, but if you go to YouTube, you can see him in his video telling his story. But anyway, he he decided he was going to do something with machine learning. So he knew nothing about machine learning, but he did. He learned about machine learning, and he developed a, an algorithm that could help detect breast cancer. And, uh, you know, it was he kind of went from zero to doing something that was actually useful and could be used and could save lives. And and these are the kind of students that are going to be coming to our campuses. So we're going to have to start thinking not so much just about how do we use artificial intelligence, how it's going to be used, but we also got to think about how the students that are coming with us are already going to be familiar with artificial intelligence and what their expectations are going to be. There were two recent Gallup polls. Um, one of them had to do with how students kind of saw saw our campuses, and the other one had to do with people's concerns about automation taking their jobs. But one thing that kind of caught my interest in these two areas for higher ed was, you know, one, you know, if students want to be able to get jobs, you know, we, we went to the thing where we made them, we wanted to make them computer literate, uh, you know, now we're, we're talking about data literacy, but now we kind of really need to make them uh, AI literate and understand algorithms because this are going to be the jobs they're going to be working in and it's not necessarily just a STEM thing just for math and sciences artificial intelligence is taking a really strong um, some strong gains in in law in uh, social services in in those types of fields um, and we need people with this ones in those areas to be able to understand artificial intelligence so they can drive it appropriately and put it in the right directions. And we also need, if we put more artificial intelligence thoughts into our curriculum, uh, we're probably also going to be able to help a little bit with people being concerned about this type of automation taking their jobs because they're going to they're going to be coming out with some skill sets that that they'll be able to use um, whatever their discipline is combined with some of these types of things to be able to to function in a more modern society. So, you know, talking about artificial intelligence is fine. And, you know, if you've been in ed tech for very long or in higher ed, you realize talk is cheap. You have to have money to really, really do anything. And so 
where's the money coming from from art for artificial intelligence and that's really kind of a tough one and one reason why it's a little bit tough is because artificial intelligence is not necessarily a um, it's not necessarily a pure discipline it's usually a combination of things so it makes it a little harder for research funding to come specifically for um, artificial intelligence so but there are some opportunities out there um, here's one for example Andrew NG he he's a um, he's a, a scientist at a, at a place called Baidu he's a he's a co-chairman and founder of course RA he's an adjunct professor at Stanford uh, you know he one of the first people to have a, a huge MOOC. I think I had 100,000 students in it. And um, anyway, he's a big name in artificial intelligence right now. And they started a fund, $175 million fund, to start AI companies from the ground up, from zero to doing something. Uh, so, you know, I think you're going to see funding opportunities coming from some of these commercial players, um, Google, possibly, you know, some of these. Facebook is big in that to AI. Uh, there's also funding opportunities, uh, you know, this one comes from from ventures.org. Uh, there's some AI funding opportunities out there. So most of the AI funding opportunities right now are going to kind of really um, be tied to research and development. And, you know, that makes it a little hard for some of us, some institutions, if we don't do that, that type of research. But I think you're going to eventually see it tied more into some some AI literacies and uh, combining it with different different disciplines that wouldn't normally be associated with this type of technology. Okay, ethics. Let's let's address the elephant in the room, which is ethics. And um, you know, yes, there are ethical concerns with artificial intelligence. Um, obviously, uh, Blackboard. Uh, I'm sure you know about Black. You've heard of the company Blackboard for Learning Management Systems. They've brought together some thought leaders to develop a framework and some standards for the ethical and legal use of artificial intelligence in higher education. So there's already talks being placed on this. Um, you know, there's not a lot out there for us to determine. You know what we need to do and how we need to do it, um, but. Once you start having any serious conversations about artificial intelligence on your campus, you're sure to get into the, the territory of ethics. And, and a lot of computer science programs right now are kind of trying to rush to get ethics um, courses put in for computer science. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe we've been a little behind on, on ethics and technology for a while. I don't know. But um, at least we, we have some people in our, in our camp that are looking at this type of thing. Uh, so what kind of things could we be doing right now on our campus to help us uh, with artificial intelligence? Well, one of them uh, is, you know, we need to kind of start thinking about, uh, you know, data, you know, and privacy. And one thing that's going on right now, you, I don't know if you're familiar with it or not, but it's the, the European uh, Union General Data Protection Regulation. And that you know even though we're not in Europe that affects a lot of things about how companies are going to use people's data uh, how they're going to communicate with them how they're using their data and it's probably one of the stronger things that have come out for data privacy at this point in time and you know of course that's going to affect US companies that deal with European companies but I think it's going to set the standard uh, for a lot of things, kind of like what Blackboard's trying to do with coming up with some ethical frameworks, I think things like the um, the European Union, Union General Data Protection Regulation will also play a big part in how how we're doing these types of things. Also in higher ed, we probably need to be doing a lot more of our own research and development. Uh, right now, a lot of what's going on in higher ed is from you know private companies, so you know we really need to kind of think about our own our own research and, and development and, and not let that slip away from us and also on the on the software side um, you know it's really easy just to buy software that vendors have created which is fantastic and there's great opportunities for partnering with vendors on that 
but we also need to kind of look at some of our own developments possibly and um, you know there's a lot of special APIs out there like the Tin Can API that can move data from say learning management systems and other systems and um, you know even though something like machine learning sounds super complex most of it's built on top of libraries that's doing a lot of the heavy lifting so um, you know it may not be as impossible as we think to be able to do some of our own software development in the area of artificial intelligence and um, you know we I think as institutions we need to really kind of consider some of that so kind of as a summary of what you can do um, number one thing you need to kind of get past the shock you don't want people when you're talking about artificial intelligence to think all of a sudden start telling the robot jokes and start talking in the robot voice um, if you can get past the shock and kind of normalize what artificial intelligence is on your campus that's going to go a long way in helping you um, start talking about artificial intelligence and start start doing some things with it that are positive the other thing is um, you know we know that generalized artificial intelligence is a long way off but it's probably also moving a little faster getting to that point than we realize so we need to start thinking in terms of curriculum development how you know how can we get AI into the curriculum um, how can we how can we use artificial intelligence to help our students learn better and um, maybe have some benefits for our faculty and you know these kind of things even though it's a long ways off it's coming faster than we think so you know you, we really don't want to just say well we'll deal with that later now is really the time to start doing that and we can do you know nobody wants to have a project and it not go well and they get embarrassed that's why I like pilots uh, if you can put together any kind of pilot on campus uh, with AI that seems to that that eases some tension a little bit and you may already have some areas on your campus where you're using artificial intelligence and um, you know you may want to want to go in those areas so you know pretty much everything we kind of most people think about when they think of artificial intelligence they've learned it from science fiction it's our job to try to bring this into the norm and and not make people think this is science fiction we don't want to we don't want to be doing a Sophia the robot routine on people where people are afraid of a robot apocalypse we want people to see where the benefits are right now and you know being responsible for AI is it's really everybody's responsibility we can't just leave this to the to the bigger names and that's that's what I hope you carry away from today is is being able to carry that message to your campus and uh, include this in some of your your technology initiatives on your campus thank you Thank you so much, Brian, and thank you to the audience for being so patient. I don't know why the slides wouldn't advance correctly in their normal format, but I hope you have access to the handout box, and you can download the slides there. You can also look for them on our website. We'll post those today, and we'll also put a link to the recording. So at this point, if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the chat box, and I'll go ahead and pass it back to our moderator, David. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so there is one question already in there. Uh, James asked earlier, is Sophia a her or an it? Uh, you know, Sophia just recently got some legs. So, um, you know, she, I think I would, I would probably, she has a, a very feminine voice. So I think, I think it just depends on where you want to want to put that at. She only weighs about, I think, 40 pounds because she's not really like a complete, being um, and I think she may have did a photo shoot shoot for Woman's Day possibly so um, I'll so, let you answer the answer the question based on those things yeah okay fair enough uh, what areas do you see higher education implementing implementing AI the fastest uh, I think AI the fastest is going to be in any of our software that's associated with student success like um, you know any of the analytics that we're doing to try to see where students may be um, failing at where um, you know trends are on our campus I think I think that's where we're gonna see it growing the fastest I think probably the most fruitful area is when we combine our um, 
our data with with actual physical locations of students on campus. I mean, we can learning management systems give us a lot of ability to see what students are doing in, in courses and how they're kind of learning. Our student success uh, softwares allow us to see how students are moving through you know our systems we have set up for them you know such as admissions and student services and I think artificial intelligence has the possibility and if we can combine that with physical sensors on campus to, to kind of aggregate that data and and tell the decision makers you know what things what things make the most sense to do uh, going forward so I kind of think that's where we're gonna we're gonna see that I think there's just gonna be too much data for us to really you know, look at with dashboards and so forth. We're going to want something that can digest all that and, and tell us what we need to do. So that's where I think. Okay. I, I know here on my campus, yeah, the, the data issue is we have so many different points of data. How do we bring it all together and make it meaningful? So I, I, I definitely see AI could play a role in that. Um, a similar question uh, is how do you think AI or does AI impact rural campuses? Well, you know, I really do think it does. Um, and I'm going to use, I'm going to, I'm going to address the word impact in a couple of different ways. One, I think if, if you think about it, I, I, I work on a rural campus and every student has, has a, a smartphone. So those smartphones have some form of artificial intelligence built into them at some some level and will continue to increase. So if that technology, if they're already walking around being affected by artificial intelligence in a rural area, I think that it's going to have an effect. I also, this is where I'm going to kind of change the perspective on the word effect. One of the things that I think, take take mobile, mobile learning, for example, for, for rural campuses. Mobile learning has always kind of been a challenge, a challenge for a rural campus because of of bandwidth. And artificial intelligence is really going to be kind of the same way. It's going to have to have the bandwidth to do what it needs to do and, and to do it in a in a good way, um, at least in a real time way. So I think I think rural campuses, like everybody, we're really we're really very dependent on bandwidth in a lot of ways. Um, Processing wise, that's probably going to all happen in a cloud somewhere. So processing is probably going to be taken care of for us. Okay, great. Um, just reading through the thing. So uh, question is from a, from Laura who says she follows AI machine learning in general, but she hasn't seen a lot of conversations in higher education. So her question specifically is, are there organizations leading the AI effort within higher ed? Yes, I would I would say Penn State they they've got a lot of information on that. They had a conference uh, recently on that, and I'll include that in the resources so you can go see that. And the and those um, those talks were were recorded. Um, also, uh, I would say in the universities in Australia seem to be doing a lot with AI, and um, so you know it's a lot there. I think I think what for for higher ed. The progression is kind of analytics, and then the next step will be artificial. The next natural step will be artificial intelligence. So I know a lot of campuses are still really struggling with trying to to get involved with with analytics. I mean, it's like you said, it's easy to have data. It's a little harder to analyze it and make use of it. It's going to be the same way with artificial intelligence. It's going to be a little harder to to jump on that that bandwagon. But you know, I think what's going to happen is before we actually have to before we ever start to have a lot of conversations in higher ed, we're going to be buying the products that have artificial intelligence built into it. So I think that it's going to be coming at us in a lot of directions and we really are not going to spend a lot of time talking about it before we start buying into it. Okay. Thank you. Probably not, and, a, positive, probably not a positive, but. <laughs> and our colleagues at Penn State or who are on the line say thank you for. for You're welcome. Um, does the Euro European Union have a GDPR driven AI agenda that you're aware of? You know, I don't know if they have an agenda, but I think that, you know, it, it boils down to, um, you know, that has a lot to do with how the data is going to be used. That's that's part of that that um, initiative. And I think that that's when you start talking about ethics of AI, that's usually one of the things that comes up. I mean, do you 
do you support the students who are going that you know are going you know say take for example funding formulas you know do you support the students on your campus the most who are going to help your funding formula do you use artificial intelligence to to find those students and give them the most resources or the most intention you know how how are we going to use use artificial intelligence and are we going to be able to apply it in an equitable manner I, you know i think i think student data is really the that's the weak chain for analytics or artificial intelligence if students don't want you to use your their data uh it hurts you a little bit right uh and then you know earlier in the presentation you talked about doing some some uh pilots or activities but nobody likes to sh you know share the the failures those types of things so question is do you see areas or do you think there are areas in which ai is ineffective i mean are there areas you think ai wouldn't even have a place to to be areas where it shouldn't even be yeah is, yeah you know uh probably probably so um you know we we have to remember that you know art artificial intelligence it's not human you know it's not human um so you know spending time with a, an actual person getting to know a professor and spending time with them and, and modeling them i think that's that's an area that that ai doesn't really have a place for i mean it, it is kind of an an existential problem for us i think in learning because you know, if, if we're going to go around with cognitive agents that can learn for us and, and tell us the information when we need them, um, you know, that kind of, you know, it kind of separates us from our, our learning a little bit and our education a little bit. So it kind of makes you wonder which which part's going to be left. But I think we're so we're so far from that. Um, you know, I, I don't think that's really probably a huge concern for us yet. I think I think probably what's going to be the thing that makes it most difficult for faculty is just, you know, are students really learning this stuff or is it their tools that know the answers? And I, you know, I know in my, in my work world, my tools know a lot more answers than I do. If you separate me from, from my computer and from the internet and all those kind of things, I don't know. I'm not nearly as uh, knowledgeable. Well, uh, Brian, that just begs the question now, how do we know this is really you? And not an yeah. AI giving your presentation. I would talk like a <laughs> robot. That's that's the joke I always get. You, I, I want you guys when y'all leave today, you go mention artificial intelligence to somebody and see if they break out the robot voice. Somebody in the group will, I promise. Oh yeah, it happens all the time. Um, I think that rounds rounds up all the questions from the audience. So I have one for you. I mean, you talked sure. about so many so many things. Just what one thing are you most hopeful about AI being able to do or to achieve? Oh, if it's the one thing AI could do or achieve, you know, I think I I, I started my career in disability services in higher ed, and uh, I worked on a grant funded program for the improvement of post secondary disability services, and the area that I worked in was with learning disabilities and you know we use computers to try to uh improve learning outcomes for people with learning disabilities you know we would this was years and years ago we would change colors of text size you know we did a lot, it, all kinds of different things with technology to try to try to make some improvements and i think for me my probably my biggest hope would be um you know for you know any anybody that that's working with trying to overcome any type of um, challenge, you know, whether it be, be physical or cognitive that they have going through a higher ed program. I'm hoping that artificial intelligence can kind of help that area because a lot of our other accessibility tools really, you know, I, you know, I don't know if you've ever used JAWS for a screen reader, you know, some of that stuff's a little hard uh, and, you know, it it's not really exactly equal sometimes. So, if anything, I would like to see artificial intelligence make some some big gains in uh, the area of of Im improving, kind of equalizing higher ed for students. Yeah, 
All right. Well, we'll leave it at that. Brian, I just want to say thank you on my behalf. It was really a fascinating uh, presentation and we'll turn it back over to, to Megan. Thanks. Great. Thank you both so much. And again, thanks for your adaptability and your flexibility today. So for those in the audience, I will be sending out a compilation of all the resources that were shared today, including those that Brian had mentioned. I will also send a link to the PowerPoint presentation. Do follow Brian and Dave on Twitter. They post wonderful resources and comments and topics there. The webcast will be posted on the website. And as I mentioned, we have a webcast coming up on GDPR, and that'll be on the 28th. So make sure to register for that. Here's the information there. And you can also see what other webcasts we have previously done, as well as our March webcast, which will be posted shortly. WCET has a couple exciting events coming up. We have our Leadership Summit in Newport Beach, California, and that's in June. And the topic is ensuring ethical and equitable access in digital learning. So I'm sure that we will touch on AI as well. So again, visit our website. I'd like to thank our WCET supporting members and our sponsors that help underwrite our programs and events here at WCET. So thank you for being part of this conversation, and we'll see you on the next WCET webcast. Great job, Brian and Dave. Thank you so much. I thought it was a great presentation. And again, I don't know what happened with the slides, but it kept me on my toes today. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's always good to have a challenge, right? <laughs> I, don't always have. I don't want to get bored. Yeah, well, the the funny thing was is that I my I could talk and I knew people could hear me, but the only way I could hear the audio was through Mike Abiati's room next door. And so I had to quickly realized that I couldn't hear, but it all worked out beautifully. So again, thank you for your time. Thank you so day. much. I appreciate it. All right. Bye all. Bye. Bye.